Uh, I'm Marco from Citus Data. I'm uh, going to talk about PG Paxos. A word of warning, if you're looking for a completely production ready solution, this is probably not the right talk to be at, but uh, hopefully it's gonna be quite interesting. Uh, so this talk will have three parts. The first part, I'm gonna talk about what is Paxos, how does it work, uh, why does it work, and uh, how can you use that to implement database replication. And then I'll go through some of the internals of PG Paxos, an extension for Postgres that uses the Paxos algorithm to do replication. And finally, I'll show you a, a demo of uh, how you set up Paxos and for an actual application. So the problem that Paxos addresses is that of distributed consensus. So let's say you have a number of servers, three, 10, 100, and you need exactly one of them to do something. So they all need to agree who gets to do the, the job, who gets to be the leader. Um, or you have a number of replicas of some data and there's updates that, to that data and they all need to agree on the order in which these updates are applied. Turns out this is an impossible problem if there are failures, which there are in distributed systems. Uh, you cannot solve consensus. You cannot write an algorithm that always reaches consensus. Let's say if you have two nodes, you cannot get them to agree on who gets to be in charge if under all failure scenarios. So Paxos is a probabilistic algorithm for achieving consensus. There's basically two classes of probabilistic algorithm. One is uh, kind of always finishes but may not succeed, and the other one is always succeeds but may never finish. And Paxos is the latter category. So if there are certain failure scenarios, Paxos may take forever. But most of the time it does not. So Paxos has built up a bit of a reputation as a very hard and complicated algorithm and there's a few factors contributing to that reputation. One of which was the original paper on Paxos which was called the part-time parliament. And the abstract of the paper is recent archeological discoveries on the island of Paxos revealed that the parliament functioned despite the peripatetic propensity of its part-time legislators the legislators maintained consistent copies of the parliamentary record dis despite their frequent forays from the chamber and the forgetfulness of their messengers. So the whole paper was a metaphor using some fictional kind of parliamentary system that never really existed as far as we know to try to explain this algorithm and no one really understood it. Like if you read this paper and then from that can figure out how to implement Paxos, you'd be probably a genius. Um, but Lampert, the inventor of the Paxos algorithm, wrote another paper a few years later where the entire abstract was, the Paxos algorithm when presented in plain English is actually very simple. And it actually is quite simple. So this is essentially the Paxos algorithm. So imagine you have a group of nodes, some well-defined group that they all know about each other. And uh, each node has a function called Paxos with a key and a value. And for a given key, this function always returns the same value on all nodes on the, in the group, and the value is one of the inputs. So one node might call it with value one, one node might call it with value five, one node might call it with value 10, and then maybe it returns five on all of them, or 10, or one. Depends on a lot of factors, but it always returns the same value on all nodes. And that's useful. Um, and so it runs in two phases. If you call this function, you become a proposer. So you propose to, uh, you basically propose a new value. But first you need to ask nodes to participate. So you ask nodes, please prepare for a new proposal. And then you need to get the majority of nodes to participate. The concept of a majority is quite important in Paxos. If you cannot get a majority to participate in your proposal for any reason whatsoever, failures, other things, you start over. If you do get a majority, you go to phase two and you request that these nodes accept a value. And if the majority of nodes at this point accept a value, you have consensus and Paxos completes. If anything goes wrong, you start over. And there's no guarantee that this doesn't take forever. Like you could start over, but usually it doesn't take forever. Um, so zooming in into phase one, um, the question that the proposer asks to the other nodes, uh, and the proposer is kind of, 
it's usually one of the node itself, but it could be could even be separate. Um, please don't accept proposals with a lower number than i. So i is some sequence number. It usually just starts at zero. And uh, the nodes receiving this message can then respond saying, okay, I'll, I'll participate. Or, well, actually I already received uh, a competing rep proposal from someone else and his sequence number was greater than yours. So I promised I would not participate in proposals with lower sequence numbers. Now they could be using the same sequence number, actually very often they are, but then you look at something else like node identifiers, something that's unique uh, across the proposals. Uh, so in that case, the acceptor sends back, hey, I already got this proposal with higher number, and then the proposer says, oh, darn, uh, I'm gonna start over, but this time I'm gonna set my sequence number to be greater than J. So it's that next time I will get my proposal through, hopefully. And the third response that the acceptors could give here is actually I already accepted a value before. So someone already reached phase two, and in phase two I accepted a value, and then uh, the acceptor sends back this value to the proposer. And when the proposer gets a value from another node, from some, someone else's proposal, it has to start using this value instead of its own. And it picks the value with the highest proposal number. So now it throws away its own value and it uses someone else's value. And this is kind of the, the trick that makes Paxos work, and I'll sh show you why in just a sec. So the second phase of Paxos, I'm gonna send messages to, the, uh, to all the nodes that are participating. Uh, please accept this value, could be my value, could be someone else's value, for this proposal number, i. And then the acceptors could say, okay, I accept your value. Or they could say, well, I already received a competing proposal with a higher sequence number, someone else ran phase one, and I promised I would not participate in proposals with lower sequence numbers, so sorry. And then the proposer starts over with a higher sequence number. Again, could take a while. Um, and then if anything goes wrong, for some reason you do not get Oak Tree, the majority to say okay, um, you also start over. And uh, finally, what you, there's usually a phase three, like you don't wanna go through all this stuff again, so if you manage to get confirmation that three nodes or sorry, the majority of nodes, so that's like two out of three, or three out of four, or three out of five, uh, accepted the value, you just tell everyone else, such that they don't have to rerun Paxos. But again, there could be failures here, and so it's not actually a critical step. You could even skip this step. It's more of an optimization. So why does this work? So actually, this, this algorithm is sufficient to provide the guarantee that it will only ever return the same value on all the nodes and the value will be one of the inputs. So why will it never return a different value? Well, if, if you kind of think of it ba backwards, and Paxos was actually kind of derived backwards from the notion of consensus, so it was, it was more of a derived algorithm than an invented algorithm. So if a majority of nodes accept my proposal, that means that no other node has completed phase one since I did. Because if another node managed to complete phase one, I wouldn't have get, gotten all my okays. One of them would have said, no, I will not participate. Because uh, to, to get my, uh, like if someone completed phase one, he would have needed a majority. And at least one node is gonna be in common with my majority. Right, that's the trick with the majorities. Um, two majorities always have at least one node in common. So because I completed phase one, uh, phase two, it means that any other proposal still needs to complete phase one and thus will see my value because they will, they will run into this, right? Because they still need to complete it, so they will definitely run into this for at least one node. And it's also guaranteed that my value has the highest proposal number that got accepted since no one else has managed to complete phase one since I did. So every other proposal that got to phase two had a lower proposal number. So basically just getting three accepts or getting a majority of accepts in Paxos tells me 
um, this is now the value that is forever going to be returned by Paxos for a particular key. How is that useful? Like, uh, this is a write once algorithm. You can set the value once and then it never changes. Well, actually, I can do something uh, which distributed systems people, we call a, build a replicated state machine, um, where the idea is if you have a bunch of nodes which all have the same state machine and the same initial state and you feed them all the same inputs, they will be in the same final state. So what I can do with Paxos is uh, replicate a log of changes, right? A log is a write, write once thing, a write only thing. So um, I can say Paxos, uh, I can use the key as kind of the, the sequence number in the log, or the sequence number in the log as a key, and my first item could be set x equals six, and then the second item could be set i equals seven, and then the third item could be set i equals nine. So if I know about all these three items, I know that the value of x equals six and the value of uh, y equals nine. So what I can do with Paxos is um, implement kind of this replicated log and I can always make sure that I know what's in the log just by running Paxos for all these values. And this, this technique is actually called multi Paxos because you run Paxos you know, multiple times. So the way I write to this log is I run Paxos for whatever I believe to be the current round number uh, or basically at the end of the log and then I, I run it and maybe Paxos is already completed and I just get back someone else's value, then I say, okay, well, I'll try with the high, next highest round number, or what I now believe to be the highest round number. And maybe someone else comes in, completes phase one before I do, my proposal loses, and then I get back his value from Paxos. Okay, I try again with a higher round number. Eventually, hopefully, I'm gonna get my value appended to the log. So my, my, my command is gonna have some round number where it has reached consensus. To perform a read, what I need to do is I'm gonna ask all the nodes, or at least the majority of nodes, what's the highest round number for which you accepted a value, knowing that that is the highest round number which could have consensus at the time that my, uh, my read started. And if I make sure I know all the values in the log up to that round number, I'm good. Like my, my log is entirely up to date up to the point when my read started. I'm gonna see any preceding read. I'm gonna get fresher information than any preceding write, uh, read. Sorry, I'm gonna see any preceding write. I'm gonna get fresher information than any preceding read. But I do need to provide some value when I call Paxos. Like it takes a value as a parameter. So what I could do is just give an empty string as the value when I want to do a read. Um, worst case, something went wrong somewhere and no value actually reached consensus in the round. And it could even be that my empty string will actually reach consensus in that round. That's fine, like nothing bad happens, this just means nothing changes. So sometimes you could have like empty entries in the log because of this. Um, and so each node has its own copy of the log and it could be arbitrarily far behind. If a node fails and doesn't get updates for an hour, uh, like its log is gonna be far behind. But it can always just run the consistent read algorithm. Say node C comes back, say, okay, I, I wanna do a consistent read on my state, or let's say my table now. Uh, I'm gonna ask node A and B, what's the highest round number for which you accepted the value? Node A will say, two, let's say, node B will say one. So node C runs Paxos for this. Somehow it actually already accepted the value here. Maybe someone tried this insert and then crashed or whatever, something went wrong. Actually another value reached consensus. So when node C runs Paxos for round one, it'll get back that value. When it runs Paxos for round two, uh, it'll get back this value. I mean, it already accepted this value but it didn't know whether there was consensus, probably. So uh, at that point, node C is completely up to date with any preceding writes, so it can 
return a result. So um, I implemented this in Postgres as an extension, so called, called PG Paxos. Um, so it's an extension you can just install in Postgres. I think it works 9.4, 9.5, possibly works on 9.6. I haven't tried. Um, and it provides consistent, fault-tolerant, multi-master table replication where you can tolerate a minority of nodes going down. So if you have three nodes, you can tolerate one going down. The trade-off that you're making is that the write throughput is going to be incredibly low because like, you cannot really have uh, concurrent writes. Like, say, you can only have one write at a time for a particular log items, otherwise they're gonna compete. And that just makes both of them take longer. So the write throughput is low, think like maybe 100 per second. And the latency is generally gonna be high. There's actually no guarantee on how high it could be. It could be very high. Like minutes, like if, no, if two nodes are down, let's say, then you, there's no way, and there are three nodes in total, there's no way to get a majority, so Paxos will take forever until one of the nodes comes back. So that's the trade-off you're making, but there's no other way to get consistent, fault-tolerant, uh, multi-master table replication. So it's not really an alternative to other replication solutions like streaming replication or logical replication. Uh, they have you know, a particular purpose, and it, this doesn't replace them in any way. It also doesn't sort of ma magically make Postgres distributed. Uh, there will never really be such a thing as distributed Postgres. In distributed systems, there's not really solutions. There's just dr different trade-offs you can make. And, uh, but it can be a very useful building block, especially for distributed systems in the way that you wouldn't do your own data storage. You wouldn't like, you know, well, most of the time you don't want to write your own serialization algorithms to write things to disk and take care of truncation and concurrency and whatnot. You use a database. Similarly, there are some very hard problems that Paxo solves, uh, which for which you probably don't want, which you probably don't want to solve yourself. And you can use PG Paxos for those. I'll give you some examples later. Uh, so PG Paxos is available on GitHub under PostgreSQL license. So it contains a very basic implementation of Paxos and multi-Paxos, which is the state machine, written in PLPG SQL. Um, which sounds a bit weird, but it's a surprisingly suitable language for implementing distributed algorithms because a lot of the time, one of the things that makes Paxos hard is you really need to be very careful about your local state and making sure you write that to disk in case there's a crash before you give any response, making sure you deal with truncation, making sure you serialize data. And actually all of that comes for free in PLPG SQL. I just do an insert on a table and then let Postgres do the work. And PLPG SQL has a networking API, DB link. It's not so great, but it works. Um, and it does make it easy to do like remote procedure calls. And the other part of PG Paxos is um, basically C code, which uses the planner and executor hooks in Postgres to provide a replication for particular tables that you want to replicate. So you can <coughs> mark certain tables as uh, replicated, and then any insert, for example, you do is going to be replicated to the other nodes using Paxos. And I should say it is somewhat experimental. Um, like. If someone, uh, like the, the most useful thing if you want to contribute to this project is actually testing. I wouldn't, I don't feel like we're missing a lot of features, but we're definitely, um, like I've done a lot of testing, but like the, the industry standard here for these types of system is actually Jepson, and it's actually quite a lot of work to do Jepson tests. Um, but any type of testing you can do would be very useful in making people confident that, um, you know, this is a, a robust system. So as I said, PLPG SQL is actually surprisingly suitable for implementing distributed algorithms. You get transactional semantics. It's easy to you know, collect a bunch of responses in a table and do some query on them. Uh, there's a simple networking API. RPC, remote procedure call, becomes pretty simple. I can just do create function, which is the one I call on the remote end, and then create another function, which uses DB link to call the other function. So it's pretty simple. And because it's PLPG SQL, and Amazon RDS and Heroku both have DB Link installed. 
Uh, I could even run this on Amazon RDS. I couldn't do the uh, sort of transparent table replication, but the Paxos functions, they would work. So uh, if you create extension PG Paxos, uh, you will get a bunch of tables, kind of boring, but just for the concepts. There's a group table, which is the Paxos groups in which this node participates. Um, so a node can be in many groups at the same time. Uh, host table is just the members of the group. The round table is a bit of a poor name for the log. Uh, so this contains the actual replicated uh, SQL queries. And there's a replicated tables which keeps track of which tables should be replicated using PG Paxos. And the Paxos extension, uh, PG Paxos also adds some functions. One is just the Paxos function that I've already described. Pretty much works exactly like that. Uh, the apply log function is pretty much the, uh, the read, the consistent read function I've described. Uh, so it, if you give it like the max round number in the group, it just makes sure that the log is up to date. Um, apply and append keeps tr is the write function I described. So it keeps trying to get consensus on its query for a particular round. And if it fails, it goes to the next round. Um, and, but you don't really need to worry about these functions so much unless you wanted to implement your own uh, replication solution or log. Um, most of the time what you do is you create a table and then on the first node in the Paxos group you do a create group where you specify your own host name such that other nodes know how to connect to you. And then uh, you do replicate table. So the data refers to the table. And uh, after this, any insert or update on the table will get replicated, added to the Paxos log, and uh, any select will make sure that your log is up to date before the select is actually executed. So um, on the first node, you do those three steps, and then on the second and third and whatever node, you do join group. Um, so you specify one of the existing servers in the group, I guess the, usually the original one, and then your own IP. And what this actually does is quite interesting. Like, if a node joins Paxos, the world kind of changes. Like, uh, before the node joins, maybe my majority was two nodes. But after the node joins, now my majority is three nodes. So I need to be aware of that. So the way that works in Paxos is actually the, the fact that this node joins is added to the log, such that any subsequent query will actually see this new node. So what happens uh, when there is an update? So as a user, you just do update uh, the table, set to do whatever. Um, then in the background, Paxos runs this, PG Paxos runs this Paxos apply and append function with uh, more or less your query. It kind of deparses it from the Postgres query plan, but more or less it will, it will log that. And then it you know, keeps trying to append. And then when it learns, okay, now I've appended it at log position 51. So I'm gonna make sure that items zero to 50 have been executed. And then I'm gonna execute the update such that my update works on a consistent copy of, of the table. And this makes basically all writes completely serializable. They're all executed in the same order on all the machines. Um, when you do a select, um, basically you run the read algorithm. So in the background, hidden transparent to the user, usually. Um, Paxos max group round gets, talks to the other nodes, asks them what's the highest round number for which you accepted a value, and then it gets its log up to date up to that point. And it knows that when this select started, like uh, any round number higher than, than that could not have had consensus because at least one node in the majority would have accepted a value for it. There's some subtleties when like new nodes join, then you have to repeat uh, the max group round. But uh, this is the general principle. Um, so I'd like to do a little demo. Are there any questions so far? So how, how do you deal with transactions if you have big people? So what you can do, and this is more of a manual, op oh sorry. The question was, uh, how do you deal with transactions? And um, 
essentially like the, the transparent table replication is more or less single statement. So you can't really do begin statement rollback or something. What you could do just using the Paxos function is just log the whole string of your transaction. Like begin, update, delete, insert, commit. You could log that as the entire string and then it'll get executed in order along with the other writes. Yeah, that'd be the, the more practical way of doing it. It would also save you on network traffic. But yeah, that's, that's entirely possible. All right. Um, so I want to show you a demo of a distributed locking system. So I don't actually need PG Paxos and the, the nodes on which I'm doing work to be the same thing. Oh, sorry, Jeff. Um, no, I mean, it, it'll end up, um, let's say when you do a consistent read and there's a bunch of items in the log that you need to execute, um, it'll end up just doing those in one transaction, basically. Uh, is that the question or? Well, any state that's recorded during the call to Paxos is actually done over the DB link. So you don't, like Paxos doesn't even, like the Paxos function doesn't even store state on itself. It's, it's assumed to be completely external. So it just talks to the other nodes as if, you know, they were external. It could be talking back to itself. But so, it, um, Let's say in, in uh, oh, this is pretty far back. <laughs> Let's say when this node responds saying, okay, I accept the value, I mean, that's, that's a separate transaction. And so actually the Paxos function doesn't record any state at all. Everything happens in those uh, remote procedure calls. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Um, The round number needs to be persistent. Uh, you need to keep track of how much of the log you have executed. So whenever you do an execute, you also update the round number of like I've executed this much of the log. Yeah, and you just find that from everyone else. You, you don't. Find Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a separate table for keeping track of like which log you've applied and then there's a table for, for the log itself which contains all the items. Um, so I'm gonna show you a demo where uh, PG Paxos is used to implement a distributed locking service. And the motivation here is doing distributed cron. This is actually quite a tricky problem if you have, um, let's say, a job that absolutely must happen every minute, but you don't want it to happen twice. So you could set up one node and then it runs this job every minute, but if that node fails, then it doesn't happen. You could set up two nodes that both run it every minute, but that's probably not what you want. So you want exactly one of them to do it. So this is kind of a locking problem. Um, of course, you could set up a database where you, uh, which has a table of locks, but then if the database goes down, you still have the same problem. But with PG Paxos, you can actually solve this. Like, so I've set up a little PG Paxos cluster using very small instances. I'm running this on EC2, so I'm using the T2 micros. 
Paxos doesn't have very high throughput anyway, so you might as well just use small instances. I put a load balancer in front of it, such that the cron node can just, will just get routed to whichever Paxos node is up and running. And then they both try to do an insert into the same locks table with, which has a primary key on the, the name of the lock. And only one of them will succeed, the other one will fail, and thus know that the other guy has the lock. So, um, yeah, as I said, I set up my cluster on EC2. There's three PG Paxos nodes and two uh, slightly bigger cron nodes. They're not gonna have to do a lot of work, but that's just how you... Mm-hmm. But not quite the merge. Right. I mean, they're not merged, right? So the list of all the accounts and all the stuff is in the cron one and cron two nodes. The, the work that's going to get done once is locally to their thing. The Paxos is going to provide the lock request. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm, um, the application I'm going to do is much simpler. I'm going to send a tweet okay. every minute. But in that example, yeah, I mean, let's say there could be some additional database in which that is stored or they do it locally, it, it's kind of independent of, of PG Paxos itself. Um, I guess technically you could actually store the accounts in PG Paxos as well. I'm not well, I was more interested in if, if the Cron 1 and Cron 2 could have been, you know, PG Paxos 1 and 2. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's technically possible. Um, I mean, usually you want these guys to be probably have some computing power depending on what they want to do. Um, I mean, like, it, you can, you don't have to, let's say. Uh, I mean, you could have the cron nodes be co-located with the PG Paxos node, or you could use them separately. Um, it's kind of all the same. And here it's, um, because I use these super tiny instances, the PG Paxos cluster costs almost nothing anyway. By the way, just to be clear, the, the Paxos log is paper, correct? Yes, I can, I'll, I'll show you the, uh, the Paxos log. Yeah, but at least if a node goes down, you don't have to actually immediately react to it. Okay. Uh, so you can automate a lot, probably. So um, I have a bunch of nodes set up here with, um, this is one of my PG Paxos nodes, so it has the PG Paxos extension. I have a, a locks table, which has like a, a key and an owner, and the key is the, the primary key. So I can only have one owner of a key at a time. And uh, on this node, I will, create a Paxos group, and then replicate a table within that Paxos group. Um, now, that's not very interesting, so I'm gonna join some additional nodes. This is one of my other Paxos nodes, and, oh, so it's PSQL, equal, then join. Okay, and the number it's showing is actually the round in the Paxos log in which it's joined. It's kind of an internal thing. Um, so at this point, I can do an insert, let's say, on this node. And then if I go to one of my other nodes and try to do the same insert, it's going to give me a primary key violation because they're now looking at a replicated table, so only one insert will succeed. So if I, this is the third node, I can see there's now one item in my log. Um, I can make it a bit more, more challenging. Uh, let's say I do an insert on one node and then immediately a select on the other node. I should then get that insert back, right? I should see I inserted AB and now I see AB on the other node in the select table. This is guaranteed by Paxos. Um, so I set up a load balancer in front of my PG Paxos node. So this just connects me to any of the nodes. Um, I, don't, I don't know which one. I can't actually really distinguish them. They all have the same content. Um, and I have a little script which will just send a tweet. Um, and I have this same script on three nodes, or two, two nodes, sorry, two cron nodes, and only one of them will send it. So I'll activate the, uh, the script. I just have a, this, and then cron runs at uh, you know, when the number of seconds reaches zero. So I could quickly open the Twitter account. No tweets yet. Um, let me talk to the 
So the problem with cron is it runs once a minute. OK, so someone grabbed the lock. Uh, note 0 0.171, grab the lock. So I should now be getting a tweet. Yes. And then uh, both nodes are running the script, but only one of them will succeed. And it's actually not like the clocks in Amazon data centers are really well synced. So they run cron almost at exactly the same time. So it kind of tends to alternate between, uh, yeah, between both of the nodes if they're both up and running. Um, so one thing I can do now is I can maybe stop one of my nodes, my Paxos nodes. Um, if now I do this, then I've got a bunch of warnings. Um, I still need to kind of clean up the output of, of PG Paxos because it shows all the stack traces of PLPG SQL. But the point is it, it did manage to do the select even though a, a node was down. Uh, it'll make one more connection attempt and then after that, um, it will just, you know, pretend it doesn't exist. Which actually makes it even, makes it a bit faster. Uh, surprisingly enough, because now it only needs to connect to two nodes. Uh, so there should be another tweet by now. Right, there's another tweet. Um, obviously, I can also take down this node. So I've stopped the cron job over here. Um, so at some point, I should be seeing, uh, in 26 seconds, I should be seeing that the other node still manages to, uh, to send a tweet. I'm not sure if Twitter shows that kind of in a live way. Uh, but so I've taken down one of the Paxos nodes. I've stopped the cron job on one of my cron nodes. So I could model this, let's say I put this in three different data centers, three different availability zones. I could lose an entire data centers and things will just work fine, uh, which is quite nice about um, PG Paxos. Right, so now the other node did the tweet. So not to uh, completely spam the pgcon hashtag, I'm gonna shut off the, uh, the cron job here. Um, okay. Any questions about the demo? All right. So what could you use this for? Uh, so this is an example of distributed locks. Um, I, I didn't go into this. I, I kind of used a bit of a cheap trick here where the name of the lock that these cron jobs are using is actually the number of minutes times 19, since 1970. Um, it doesn't actually rely heavily on synchronized clocks. If one clock is ahead, then most of the time that one will just win because it will be the first one to grab the lock. But then, then if that fails, then the other guy, there might be some you know, several minutes where, let's say the other guy's several minutes behind on its clock that it might take a while before it starts tweeting again. But in Amazon data centers, it's usually synchronized up to the millisecond, so it's not really an issue. Um, so PG Paxos works well for any application that has low read write volumes, but str strong consistency requirements and no, no strong latency requirements. So distributed locks is one. If you have this type of cron job, um, any type of resource management, like we can only have one node access a certain resource at a time, uh, it works quite well for that. Also for managing cluster membership. I mean, PG Paxos manages its own cluster, but it can also manage other clusters. And this is actually one of the most common applications for, for Paxos. And this, for example, also includes deciding which node is the primary. And so you could imagine an application which, uh, where you use Paxos to decide which out of a, group, a streaming replication group gets to be the primary. Um, and then Paxos can tolerate one of the nodes failing. You could use it as a job scheduler. Uh, Alvaro recently did a blog post showing how you could use uh, PG Paxos to implement a job queue which has like exactly once semantics, whereas uh, most queuing systems have at least one semantics, so the job could happen multiple times. Uh, migrations, if you want to move over a lot of data from one place to another, even schema migrations, or as a source for metadata. Like often if you have a system where, let's say, all nodes have a copy of the metadata, there's one authoritative source. But if you don't want to be subject to that source going down, 
you would have to use something like PG Paxos to make sure that you have a replicated consistent copy of the metadata. So why not Raft? I get this question a lot. Um, well, one is it, Paxos can be implemented in PLPG SQL, which makes it quite suitable for implementing in Postgres because it's actually really simple and it, there's almost like a one-to-one -one mapping of sentences in the paper to SQL queries in, in the source code because you don't have to worry about transactions and truncation and serialization. What is raft on Paxos? That's, that's a good question. What is, the question is what is raft? Um, so there is a slightly newer consensus protocol. It um, works by kind of electing a master basically. It has a, very, a quite a good algorithm for quickly switching, um, making one of the nodes the master and if the other one goes down very quickly another one becomes the master. Um, and well one of the differences, uh, like th this has been a recent paper and it was, the paper was very instructive to engineers. It told you, told you exactly what to do, whereas the Paxos papers are a bit more mathematical. So um, Raft has picked up a lot of steam lately in, in new, newer distributed databases because the paper is easier to implement in some sense. Though actually Paxos as an algorithm is, is much simpler. The minimal implementation that works is a lot simpler. You can kind of play with it more to be adapted to your requirements. I really wanted it to be multi-master so I could do writes from anywhere. And mathematically, it's very elegant. Like, in a way, Lemper didn't invent it. it. He just derived it from the notion of consensus, like what, what would I need to do? And uh, it's actually also optimal for, uh, for achieving consensus. But actually, the more realistic answer probably is, I knew Paxos quite well, I knew PLPG SQL quite well, and I figured, I think I could implement Paxos in PLPG SQL. So that's my story. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Are there any questions? So um, <coughs> let's say you wanted to use it just like you said to uh, elect a master to your team in Paxos. Mm -hmm. No, because uh, PG Paxos keeps its state in tables. Um, so on the secondaries, yeah, I, I suppose it could work for logical replication or if you create another database cluster that's co-located with these nodes. Um, yeah, unfortunately it doesn't, doesn't work on secondaries. Josh. I was gonna ask Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would typically just recommend running it in this type of setup where PG Paxos is actually an external component running on tiny hardware uh, because then it's just already up and running when you bring up your big data production cluster so you don't really have, have the problem. And you could, you know, you could reuse the PG Paxos cluster for other stuff. It's, it's a bit similar in the way people use Zookeeper. They just have this external Zookeeper deployment uh, which, which solves a similar problem. So would you currently be adding a node to the instance? Um, so the question is what is adding a node like? And it's essentially just you set up uh, Postgres, you install the PG Paxos extension. Um, you also need in postgresql.conf to add it to shared preload libraries. But once you have a node, it's pretty much just you call this join group, oh, actually there's one step missing here you first need to create the same tables. Um, it doesn't replicate the DDL yet. It seems to be a common problem with replication solutions. Uh, but then you just call Paxos join group and this actually more or less clones the state of an existing node. So any data that's already in the table, it copies over. Uh, the membership table, it copies over. Uh, at this point it might be interesting to show this. This is actually the Paxos log that I've been talking about. So these are the queries that have been executed on, on, uh, on the table. Um, but yeah, joining a node is mostly setting up the tables that are replicated and then calling join group. And then uh, join group also makes sure that all the other nodes know about this node. And there's a corresponding leave group, which gives some errors because the other node uh, is down or errors warnings. 
but uh, now it's now it's left a group. Mm, it depends. Let me see, actually. Um, so it's a elastic load balancer. So the way elastic load balancer works, uh, so this is an Amazon service, it sets up a EC2 instance more or less in every availability zone in which you have instances, and then sets up, uh, uses route 53 to set up DNS records pointing to each of these things. So let, let's say one data center goes down, like you know I took down one of my Paxos nodes, one of my cron nodes, one of these guys will also go down, but I still have two left. So my clients can just talk to any of those two, and ELB is constantly doing health checks, so ELB will detect, oh, this Paxos node is no longer running, don't send any traffic there. So actually the, the single point of failure is kind of taken care of in ELB, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's trickier in your own kind of architecture to do that. Um, probably the simple. Yeah, pretty well, much. It depends. Uh, so, Amazon um, or the load balancer actually is a load balancer. So, any new connection will typically go to a different one of these machines. Uh, and it, I mean, it performs constant health checks to, to figure out who's up and running. But there's no like, you know, Amazon doesn't really pick like I'm always going to send my traffic to this machine. It's, uh, every time you connect, you actually get connected to a different machine. Um, well, you, if you try like with an ELB and you uh, you disconnect and reconnect and disconnect and reconnect, pretty much always it connects to a different one. Um, it actually just routes or picks a node based on your source port. Uh, kind of uses a hashing function of that source port. Um, that at least used to be the algorithm. I used to be at Amazon, so I I, I know what it was like two years ago. I don't know what it is now, but. Um, I, yeah, no, it, it does. And I think actually, so the question is, uh, there's no tech conceptual technical reasons that you couldn't replicate DDL. And I'm trying to remember, I think actually if you do something like create index, it actually does replicate it because it's kind of easy. Um, alter table is a bit tricky because uh, PGPuxos kind of sits just before execution when the planning has already been done, and if then there's an alter table happening before that, then the execution no longer makes sense. Um, so that's, that's a, or the plan is no longer correct. So that's, uh, there's some limitations around that, but doing something like create table actually isn't a problem, but then there's nothing to activate the, uh, the Paxos log. Like once I query the locks table, that's when I start replaying the log. But if I don't have a locks table, then how do I start? I mean, we, I could just create a function for that or something, but that's not there at the moment. Uh, good question. Is the Paxos log rotated? Currently, it is not. It will grow infinitely. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's also no reason it couldn't be rotated. <laughs> um, pretty much if you know all your nodes have reached a certain point, then you can just drop everything that came before then. Um, there's just currently no logic to do that. <laughs> All right, that's uh, my time. Uh, thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any other questions, I'll be around. <laughs>